Keith Beverly, I'm the managing partner and chief investment officer of Grid 202 Partners. Uh, we're an independent wealth management firm here in North Carolina. Also have a big presence in the Washington, D.C. area. Want to extend a thank you to Sam and the Uncut team for allowing us to present to you all today on financial planning one on one for collegiate athletes. Uh, so I'm joined today by Jose Lopes, who is an associate advisor at our firm, and he's going to give you some fundamentals of financial planning for, for you all as college students for 10 minutes or so. And then we're going to jump, jump into a panel discussion with three former and current professional athletes. So with that, Jose, you want to get started? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll give a, a quick introduction myself. Um, so I just finished my master's degree in investment management and quantitative finance. Um, and I have a few years in, in investment banking and also in asset management, probably say around four. I worked at State Street and Loomis Sales. But before that, uh, like many of you in the audience, I was actually a high school athlete. Uh -huh. um, and I was the high school you know, football captain. I was the high school track captain. But as soon as my high school career, I guess you can call it a career, um, was over, um, I had to figure out what, what I wanted to do. Um, so I started looking for a passion and, and, and investing crossed my path. And as soon as I started to learn more about investing and finance, I started to dive into it. And I started to realize that a lot, a lot of people just don't understand finance, right? Or, or how to build wealth. Uh, and so I started to you know, reach out to community members and um, started to help other people out. And that grew into a passion itself. So part of this presentation here today is going to be about you know, how do I share this, this information that I have, this financial literacy information, and give it to you, deliver it to you within 10 minutes. So a few topics that we're going to cover um, here, you know, how to calculate your net worth, um, how do you do with credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. But the three key points that I want you guys to take from this is first and foremost, how do you determine what your current financial position looks like? Secondly, how do you build a strong foundation uh, with sound decision making? And thirdly, how do you understand what steps you can take to build and maintain wealth? So let's start with how do you figure out what your financial position looks like? So the first thing you want to do is calculate your net worth, right? So what you're going to do first and foremost is take all of your assets, which just means what do you own? That can be home, car, stocks, uh, whatever they may, that may be. Then you take all of your liabilities, which is what you owe. That could be your mortgage, a car loan for that car, student loans, and you subtract that from your, all of your assets and that will give you your net worth. Now, the importance of calculating your net worth and figuring out what your financial position is, is to determine what steps you need to take next to uh, create a foundation where you can build wealth, right? And generally, the first two steps that we tend to advise um, is first, build three to six months of expenses. So that way you can have, really what this is doing is buying you time, right? So let's say a financial crisis strikes, right? Uh, you'll have three to six months of expenses or really three to six months of time to help you out um, and prepare you for the future. Um, and secondly, you wanna be able to pay off all of your high interest debts. Now, the killer of all high interest debts is credit cards. So credit cards are really a tool, right? So credit cards really should only be used if you want to build your credit score. Now your credit score is really used if you want to um, borrow money from a bank. Let's say you wanna take out a mortgage or you want to take out a car loan, um, any type of loan, you need a high credit score for them to validate you and say, this person is credit worthy. The things that you shouldn't do with a credit card is buy things that you can't afford and buy things that will not give you a greater return on that investment. Credit cards in general are just terrible because they uh -huh. have extremely high interest. Um, they can range from 20 to 25% and they are real killers of your net worth. So you wanna, stay away from them as much as possible. So once you have that foundation set up, you understand exactly where you are, 
um, financially and you and you build uh, this mindset of um, how do I build wealth, um, you want to start understanding where you're spending your money and how it's being allocated, right? So let's talk about appreciating and depreciating assets. So if you're going to put your money appreciating assets like a home or investment tools, what you're doing is you're building your wealth over time. If you put it towards depreciating assets like a car, let's say you buy a new TV or a laptop, I'm not saying these are bad things, but I'm saying that these will depreciate in value over time. To give you a good perspective on what this looks like, let's take this Tesla Model S, right? Let's say you buy it for $80,000 today. After just one year, that car will lose over $10,000 in value. Over three years, it'll lose over $30,000 in value. And after 12 years, that car is worth almost nothing. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing to buy a depreciating asset, but just understand what your financial position looks like and understand, can I afford it and is it necessary? These are the types of questions you wanna be asking yourself. Now that you have this foundation all set and you understand exactly what you're looking to spend your money on, you wanna start thinking about how do I build my wealth, right? So this is all about investments. So there's different things you can invest in. Uh, you don't have to lock yourself into these different five different categories, right? So you have equities, which really just means that you're buying a portion of a company. Uh, bonds is you're lending money and you're getting paid in interest. Mutual funds are uh, active funds that are typically a combination of equities and bonds. You can also invest in real estate, commodities. There's also foreign exchange, uh, cryptocurrencies, commodities. There's so many different investment vehicles for you to invest in. Um, and the reason why you want to start investing is compound interest. So this is how compound interest works. Let's say you have $10,000, right? And you want to invest in the S&P 500, which generally gives you a return of seven to 8% every single year. And you invest that for 30 years. Uh, if you were to just um, invest that $10,000 without um, reinvesting your profits, you would about triple your money within 30 years. But if you were to reinvest your interest, the interest that's being paid to you, then over 30 years, you can multiply your money by probably seven times. So in this case, if you were to invest the $10,000, you would turn that into around $76,000 over 30 years. Now, there's different ways that you can get started with investing. Um, a lot of people probably heard of Robinhood. Um, that's a great way to start. That's how I personally started. Um, just, you know, I, I started just buying a lot of random stocks. That's definitely not the way to go. I would recommend starting with some ETF so you could, you know, diversify your investments. Um, but you could also is like TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab, or you could look at different mutual funds so you don't have to make those investment decisions for you. But however you get want to get started, just start somewhere, right? Another option is a robo-advisor, which is a, another great option, right? So Betterment, Wealthfront, these are great for assessing or allowing you to tell the robo advisor how much risk you want to take in your investments and they will invest for you. So if you wanna be aggressive, if you wanna take a lot of risk, you can do that. And if you wanna be more conservative, you don't like to see a lot of those price fluctuations, they have that option as well. Uh, Grid to a two, we're actually, um, working with Charles Schwab to build our own um, robo-advisor as well. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, another option, instead of you know, investing in yourself or going to a robo-advisor, is finding a financial advisor. Um, a lot of you may not have the financial means, but when you do, finding an advisor can be extremely important in allowing you to make the right financial decisions for your own life. So the two main questions that I like to ask um, when speaking with a financial advisor is, one, what credentials do they have? And two, are they a fiduciary? So starting with the fiduciary part, what does that mean? Well, if you go to a advisor and they tell you that they're going to put you first, then they are a fiduciary. Typically you'll find uh, advisors with specific credentials like a CFA or a CFP 
which in itself is they're considered uh, fiduciaries because they um, follow the fiduciary code of those uh, credentials of those institutions, right? So for example, Keith has both a CFA and CFP and by having those uh, designations, he is certifying, he's letting uh, all of his clients know that he's always going to put them first. So that's the most important thing. Now, the different credentials that you want to look for in an advisor, uh, there's so many different, it's not just a CFA or a CFP, there's also the CAIA, the CPWA, um, there's many out there. But really, um, if you're looking for somebody who specializes in financial planning, the CFP is more for you. But if you want to look for somebody that's more specialized in investments, it'd be more so the CFA. Now, if you want to find a CFP uh, professional, you can go to cfp.net. And on the top right corner, you'll be able to find uh, a CFP professional. You just put in your location and you'll be able to find them there. Now, if you guys found any of these uh, resources helpful, uh, we'll definitely send out this presentation towards the end. And you guys can uh, look for all of these resources that we have here. Uh, so you can you know, see, see different graphs that we have, um, the different uh, self-investment brokerages, how to find a financial advisor and, and robo-advisors as well. Um, this is our contact at Grid202. I really appreciate you guys for, for joining us today. And thank you to the panelists for joining us as well. And I'm looking forward to, to having this conversation. Thanks, Jose. That was um, that was good. I know I know we gave you a, a tall task to give a, a crash course in financial planning in, in 10 minutes, but you were up for it. So so we appreciate that. And uh, it looks like we have one question in here that we'll we'll get to um, later on when we open it, open up the, the, the discussion for Q and A. Uh, so I'm going to jump in to introductions of our esteemed panelists, and I'm going to be brief with the introductions. I'm going to let them talk a lot about themselves. And I'm gonna go in the order that, that I see everyone on my screen. So I'm gonna get started with uh, with Julie Waita. Is that right, Julie? Got it, all right. So uh, Julie, quick background on Julie. I'm gonna um, hopefully embarrass you a little bit with some of your accolades. Uh, but Julie, Julie played at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Uh, she was a Wade Trophy Wooden Award finalist. Horizon League Tournament MVP, All-American, and, uh, and this is basketball. So Julie's a basketball player. Julie's uh, a forward and, and guard, uh, and she plays internationally now. So that's Julie Waita. Next, we have Darian Mack, who is uh, a native North Carolinian for, for those who are in North Carolina. Uh, Darian, where'd you go to high school, Darian? Uh, I went to Wakefield High School. It's in Wake okay. Forest. Okay, Darian went to Wakefield in, in Wake Forest, then went to the University of Kentucky, where she played uh, volleyball for them. Uh, Darian was, during her time at Kentucky, Kentucky was a very impressive 128 during her time there. She was an outside hitter. She ranked 10th in Kentucky's single season record book with 363 kills. Sounds very violent. Darian, 363 <laughs> kills, um, eighth all-time in career kills with 802, and she finished her career uh, as a four-time Arthur Ashe Award recipient for excellence in the classroom and athletics. And last but not least, we have Zach Miller. So Zach is currently an associate at Athlete Wealth Management. He played for eight seasons in the NFL at uh, the C Seattle Seahawks, where he picked up a nice Super Bowl ring um, when he was playing with the Seahawks. Uh, Zach finished off his degree at Arizona State uh, where he graduated summa cum laude. And um, after finishing off his, uh, his degree, um, Zach passed the CFP exam recently in, in March and congrats on that, Zach. And once he finishes up his, his work experience, which he's well on his way to do, he'll have the, the CFP credential after his name. So with that, that's our esteemed panelists. And to kick off the, the discussion today, I have, a, I have a, a question for all of you. And that question is, who was the athlete that inspired you the most growing up? 
And what was the most difficult aspect of making the transition to your first job out of college? And I'll let Darian go first with that one. <laughs> okay, thanks Keith for uh, the uh, introduction. It was very lovely, I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so again, hello everyone, I'm Darian Mack. Um, I'm currently an assistant volleyball coach at the University of Southern Mississippi. So I'm down here in Hattiesburg, uh, Mississippi. And uh, you know, with COVID and everything, we kind of had a slow fall season. So we're hoping to pick that up in the spring. But uh, to answer your question, I think my favorite athlete growing up is definitely Serena Williams. Um, she has endeared so much throughout her career, her toughness, her grit. Um, you know, she doesn't obviously look the part of a typical tennis athlete, but she's still in the game and she's still winning championships. So she's definitely um, one that I've always definitely looked up to and still look up to uh, till this day. And um, so it's pretty cool to see her keep balling out there. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say one of the hardest things of transitioning just from being a top athlete into now the working world is just kind of a identity crisis almost. You kind of you know, you play a sport throughout your whole life. And then if you identify that as yourself, like I'm a volleyball player and after you're done with your eligibility and it's kind of stripped away a little bit, it's kind of like, well, who am I now? So I think that was probably the, one of the hardest things about transitioning and just kind of refining yourself and learning new things that you enjoy doing because most of the time for collegiate athletes and professional athletes, it, this is your job. It takes up most of your life. And so when that's over with, it's just kind of finding uh, what you do after that. Mm -hmm. Julie, you want to take that next? And you're on mute too, Julie. Sort of important. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. And thanks, Keith, for the intro. Um, yeah, so I was thinking after I graduated college uh, to play a year or two overseas, um, and then I ended up just falling in love with the lifestyle. So um, I'm walking into year nine now, still over here. So I played two in uh, Belgium, five in Italy uh, last year in Spain, and now I'm back in Italy again. Um, but I just fell in love with uh, a lot of pieces of this lifestyle. Um, and now walking down the path, starting to figure out what I want to do um, to transition after sport and walking down the entrepreneurial path. Um, as far as the athlete, um, I've been asked this question before and I honestly don't think I have one. I've uh, like taken little pieces from everyone. I think I was into also for whatever reason, watched a lot of snowboarding and tennis, skateboarding, a lot of alternative, uh, alternative sports as well. And just really found an appreciation of seeing people in their flow state, you know, that someone's really passionate and you can tell they put the work in and things like that. So um, I think I've, I've stolen a little bit uh, pieces from a number of different athletes. Um, and then the most difficult aspect um, for now, my body's holding up. So I've been fortunate enough to stay in sport um, still, um, but it's definitely a completely different world over here. So adapting to things and Darian can probably speak on this as well. Um, you just sort of plopped out of, out of a plane, you feel blindfolded, um, and things are very, very different than, um, college sports and sports in the U S. So, um, just learning adaptability, uh, was really big over here. So what about you, Zach? Well, first, thanks for the intro, Keith. And, uh, yeah, I grew up in Arizona, was an uh, Arizona kid and went to Arizona State. So, you know, once my career got over with the Seahawks, uh, I left early from school. So I came back and finished my degree at ASU and, you know, Phoenix is my home. So getting the start here, um, kind of lucky the way things aligned with AWM and being able to find a passion. Um, as far as making the transition, uh, you know, fo football and uh and finance and investments don't have a lot in alignment, uh, you wouldn't think, but you know, the same, same worth work ethic and the same values, you know, that make you successful in sports, um, the things it teaches you, uh, you know, help, help me, helped me make that transition. And I was an NFLPA representative during my time, uh, in three years in Oakland, four years in Seattle. So I saw 
how money wasn't always, you know, well kept. Wealth wasn't created as as well as it should have been for guys in the NFL. So I was uh, I was always interested in investments, and so it was a natural fit. And it took me a while after I was done playing to figure out exactly what what I wanted to go after once I was done. You know, because you you know as a player you can look at coaching, you can look at going into you know whether it's business or uh, broadcasting that that type of aspect of the game. But um, you know I've, I've always had a passion for for finance and investments and having a chance to to work with people that I care about the most um, and athletes and helping them. Cause I, I know how I was as a young guy. And, and, you know, the, I think the most difficult part of the transition was I was making a resume to send out. And my, uh, my professor told me that I needed to rewrite the whole thing basically, because this looks like you're applying for a football position somewhere and not, <laughs> not a, not a finance job. So, uh, you know, it was, it was funny cause you don't, you don't realize the perspective until someone, you know, it's like, you know, I don't, she's like, I don't care about football. You need to change this thing. <laughs> it was a great wake up call for me that like, yeah, you just because you're good at football doesn't mean you're going to, you're going to earn anything anywhere else. You got to, you know, you got to earn it the, the hard way and learn. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, 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 it's good when you can find another passion, uh, you know, because football was of course my first passion and I, it's all I wanted to be growing up, but having the opportunity to, to do something else I also love is, you know, I'm thankful for that. Um, for my favorite player, for sure, Jerry Rice. Um, as a kid, I was a. I grew up in Arizona, so the Cardinals weren't as they weren't good at the time. So I, I saw Jerry Rice. He caught everything they threw his way. That was like his thing. And uh, I was hoping to be a wide receiver and got too big, and they moved me to tight end. So <laughs> I still tried to catch everything and and then learn to block. So. I mean, Jerry Rice, hands down, my uh, my go-to because just the way he worked, um, the, the kind of receiver he was, the the competitor, that's that's what I always loved about him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Zach. I think we're going to go around Robin. So I'm, I'm going to stay with you for a second, Zach. So yeah. uh, tell me, you mentioned just a, a second ago that um, the the transition of sports and the skills that you you acquire as an athlete, you can you know transfer them to to the, the professional world in a different capacity. Talk some about some of those characteristics and what you developed as an athlete for all those years and how you're going to carry that with you into your, your role now with AWM. Uh, I think some of the biggest one is, is work, the work ethic and the grit it takes to be successful in sports. Um, you, should, you, you carry that, you're going to carry that the rest of your life. The, 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 the moments where it's hard and you push through, it, it's going to, you know, come up in other aspects of your life, whether that's, you know, w once you're married, when you have kids, uh, there's just so many situations where sports teaches you how to fail and then come back, work hard, and then and then succeed. So you, you know that the plan doesn't always go like it's drawn up to. That's why you, you, uh, you have, you know, coaches, people around you, things that um, you learn from. And so really all, Everything the the commitment it takes to be good in in, in you know, especially at the pro level uh, is is just unparalleled. So you that can transition easily into a, a, you know once you're done playing and, and collegiate sports especially. I mean even if I wasn't to play in the NFL would have taught me so much about uh, how in, how to persevere adversity and then the grit it takes to succeed at whatever you're trying to achieve and, and be the best at or, or work towards. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Julie, turning to you for, for a second. So you mentioned uh, you're going down the entrepreneurial route. Uh, tell us some about your entrepreneurial venture and, and what you're working on. And, and particularly tell us how you're preparing for it while you're still playing professionally. Mute, mute. I'll learn eventually. Mute, Julie. Uh, <laughs> so last year, uh, November, we had a few days free and I, um, I met up with some athletes in Tel Aviv um, and one of them um, we got to talking and, and she's the founder of a company called Wevolve. Um, so we realized just talking through some things that a lot of our visions um, and values sort of matched up. Um, and she's been, the uh, ideation process has been about two and a half years for her and I hopped on probably eight or nine months ago. Um, and in the company, it's called Wevolve, so it's We Evolve Together, um, and it's a members members only community to help athletes 
sort of manage all the pieces of their career. Um, and there's things within the pillars of player empowerment, mentorship, and just um, also from the lifestyle aspect. Um, and we're looking to create an ecosystem among ourselves. Um, so obviously, you know, people that have walked your same path, of course, there's variances, but um, there is a deeper level of understanding and um, trust that can be built throughout that. Um, we sort of consider ourselves a lost community um, and also a captivating culture. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's a very different experience over here uh, and, and a lot of different um, services provided to pro and athlete, uh, collegiate athletes stateside. Um, but there's really a lot of gaps missing in this overseas market and there's thousands and thousands of us over here sort of going through the same struggles. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to um, assess where we can help different athletes along their journey and just create a better um, experience and lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of things out there now, for example, you know, you have wearables and different performance software um, and all these things that dig deeper into your athletic performance. Um, but what's really missing in our opinion is the human side of it. Um, and it's, it's cool what Sam's doing, for example, with Uncut, because you're starting to talk about things outside of sport um, and really getting to the human side of the athlete. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of value in that. Um, and I think once you, once you start to understand the layers of the person, um, you know, why they think the way they think or why they, you know, act the way they do, um, it's a moment of deeper understanding where you can really start to create positive change. Um, and we can tie this into even your money habits, you know, your roots and your family background and cultural things. These all affect how you deal with money, how you think about money, how you go about and present yourself dealing with money. And these are things that um, obviously tie into to your day to day life. Um, for example, last week we did a session with um, three financial therapists and a group of athletes. Um, just digging deeper on these topics. And I think really it's the foundation before, you know, you even go to an advisor that you can really dig deep into. And then, you know, once you get to a point where you can understand these things about the way you act and think, then you can take, um, you know, what your advisor is giving you to really have a positive impact to work that into your life. Um, and, you know, obviously I think there's layers with any human being with money. Um, but I think athletes, there's an added layer to it just because, you know, you're more in the public eye, um, you know, maybe you came from less and then the first couple of years you're, you're coming into a lot of money. And so there's a lot of complexities that you have to go through to learn how to deal with these things. Um, not just the money, but the psychological pieces behind it. Um, and so, you know, we've all, that's one of the pieces we've all wants to help athletes with. Um, and just give a, a more holistic view of an athlete's experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No, see, you touched on some great points there, Julian. And um, you know, one of the things that we, we see in research is that athletes um, tend, to, tend to be more overconfident when it comes to their, their financial decisions. So that's even a, another um, important um, you know, characteristic and, and tidbit about the money psychology when you're talking about athletes and, and how they're thinking about money. Um, so Darian, so sticking with the, with the international piece for a second, what was it like playing volleyball internationally and how do you like the experience? What are, what's, what, what's your most memorable moment of, of playing, um, playing abroad in that international experience? Uh, so I decided after, um, I graduated college and I just, I felt like I had a little bit extra in the tank. So I was like, you know, I think I, I'll just take this you know, an extra step and, you know, explore playing overseas professional. And, you know, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, if I try it and I don't like it, you know, at least I did it and I'll come back. And if I do like it, then, you know, I'll stay there. So um, I got my first contract and it was in the country of Finland. So it was <laughs> definitely uh, somewhere I've never been before. And obviously I don't speak Finnish. I don't really know many people that do speak Finnish. So that was kind of a already the nervous front of just, you know, I don't speak the language. I, you know, Julie kind of hinted at this too, you know, you get your contract, you sign it, they get you your tickets and put you on a plane and somebody will meet you at the airport and you're, you know, off and ready to go and play for a team. So 
Um, I definitely felt like I had a good playing experience. Um, there are, there was a little bit of disconnect sometimes. I think there's definitely a big difference between being a collegiate volleyball player and a professional volleyball player overseas. Um, the rules are different. Uh, there's different, definitely different expectations uh, mm -hmm. for different positions, um, which I had no idea about, but you know, some positions are more important in the international league than there would be in the uh, collegiate league. And uh, so that was definitely a wake up call. And like I said, the, the rules are a little bit different and just trying to, um, the training is different. And so that was kind of um, a little bit of a tough part when you first get there and, but you kind of adapt to that and you have teammates that will, you know, help translate what the coach is saying. And, you know, you just kind of figure it out from there. And so, um, I definitely had, again, like I said, a really good experience. It was nice to, uh, meet new people, kind of live in a different country and kind of get pushed to, um, kind of forced out of your comfort zone, which, um, you know, you, it's again, you're far from home and further than you don't know anybody there. So I think that's always just good to be put into a situation like that and kind of learn and grow, um, from there. And, um, again, experiencing a new culture, it was something that I'll never, I think that whole thing is something I'll never forget. It's just, you know, trying the new food, learning different, uh, you know, Finnish people just love to have a good time. And so that was definitely, uh, fun to experience and, uh, something memorable. So there, we had a team up in Northern Finland and it was actually the North pole and they had Santa Claus land. And so I got to <laughs> actually go to the North, like Santa Claus land. Like that is something I definitely wouldn't have done if I was just traveling leisurely. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was definitely, um, exciting. And, um, I think it's doing that. I always recommend to my players, to my, uh, friends that have played. I'm like, if you have an opportunity just to try it at least for one season, I definitely say it, um, you know, a job in graduate school and, for the education is always going to be there, but having the opportunity to play at the next level and just kind of experience something new. Um, I definitely say, just try it, just try it out. Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, one of the piece of advice I always give people that are asking about career uh, direction is get an international experience if you're able to, mm -hmm. because if, if nothing else, it just creates opportunities for great stories when you're in interviews. <laughs> when you're in an enemy and you because once you get past the technical knowledge and everyone has the technical knowledge like you know it, the question becomes is this an interesting person is this somebody i want to have on my team and i just want to you know hang out with um so the international experience is great and it's, it's wonderful that, that both of you can speak to that a bit for for everyone that's on the call today um so zach a, a question for you as a, a super bowl champion um when you think about you know you, you you're in that moment you won the super bowl and you know, what's, what's next? Like, what's the next best thing for you? Um, probably win another Super Bowl, right? But in, in the professional world, in the world of financial services, as a financial advisor, to you, what would be the equivalent of that Super Bowl victory and that, that, that same taste that you savored in that moment as a, as a Super Bowl champion? What, what's that equivalent for you in, in your role now, AWR? Great, great question. Um, I was actually talking with a, another guy about this, and it's, it's, it's gotta be something tough. So it's going to be to change the entire narrative around NFL players and the fact that they, they're always worse than stats when it comes to bankruptcy or financial distress or being defrauded and uh, basically making it. So that's not the narrative anymore to where it's, it's, that's a thing of the past, an old stereotype and, you know, NFL guys and the rest of athletes are smart with their money. Cause there's just so many, I mean, I know I look at myself when I was younger and there's so much you don't know about the financial world um, that I know now that that I want to be able to communicate to, to those young athletes and, and get them on the right track, help them as much as I can. And, and I think it's it's doable. And especially the way uh, the way technology is and the way you can communicate with people um, really develop, you know, develop those habits. And, you know, I think about the presentation. And when I was 19 years old at Arizona State, I remember the credit card companies would be on campus uh, giving out credit cards. So I hope they don't do that anymore, but I just- They've actually banned that. They actually banned that. They banned that, yeah. That's how I got my first credit card. So it's like, 
I mean, it's it's right. it's a bad habit to get in on on using debt the wrong way, and then uh, you know so much so much stuff I know, that that I know now that that I think will be you know help me moving forward. Okay, no, definitely. Um, that's that's great. Uh, so Darian, so so a question for you. I know, you know right now you, you transition from uh, you know being a professional athlete to, to coaching. If you were to ever make a a different move outside of coaching, uh, what do you think that would be? What what, do you, what could you see yourself doing outside of coaching and and you know take some of those same skills that, that you're learning uh, that are transferable and and do something and, and also excel at it. Um, I think uh, sports, I'm, I, I'm a huge sports girl. I, it's part of me. And so I definitely think I would try to stay in the sports world and just kind of uh, move into probably like the nonprofit sector and try to, uh, I guess the goal would just be to increase the amount of uh, females in, in sports and not just playing the sport, but actually um, you know, being a coach right now, I've seen it all. It's kind of being a collegiate sports. It's um, kind of like a boys club almost. And, yeah. you know, in all aspects, not just coaching, but just in administration, you know, athletic director, um, associate athletic directors in the marketing department or, uh, you know, things like that. And so I definitely would try to be in a position where I could, um, and kind of keep women and girl, young girls in sports in all aspects. And, um, you know, I was actually looking at some numbers and there's only like, I believe, you know, six, five or six uh, female athletic directors in the power five conference. And we have, you know, 60, there's like 68, you know, collegiate teams um, in the power five. And so definitely that number is uh, very disheartening. And so I would love to just kind of diversify that a little bit in all aspects of sports and as well as uh, just trying to get equal pay for in all fields sure. as well for uh, females. And again, uh, even head coaching, just trying to level the playing field a little bit. And so definitely being in this role, I've seen that. And if I weren't uh, be in the position to coach, I definitely would try to uh, make that transition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so question for you, Julie, don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> so with you being a, uh, an entrepreneur, I'm curious as to whether or not it's easier or more difficult with you being um, a professional athlete as you're going into a, a new venture. Like, do you find that people are receptive or more willing to you know, engage in the conversation because you're a professional athlete, or do you find that you have to you know, really prove yourself and, and make sure that they you know, recognize that you're a sharp businesswoman as well? Yeah, I mean, definitely even, even, okay, COVID wasn't the best for the rest of the world, but for the company of Weevolve, it was good because, uh, you know, it gave us the opportunity to really uh, dive in all the way in with a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And our season, for example, was canceled last March. Um, and so, you know, we had six solid months uh, to be able to focus on those things. Um, and yeah, just connecting with, with different people, um, different avenues, uh, I use LinkedIn a lot. And also there's, you know, Upstream and some other apps where you can get connected with um, business professionals, CEOs, um, venture capitalists, all those kind of things. And I think being an athlete gives you a little added intrigue you know it's uh you know sports in some way touches a lot of different people um whether they've played or their fans or or some type of way um and it really creates a community among people um and so i think a lot of people enjoy talking about that um are intrigued especially as you mentioned earlier um with the overseas piece international piece um and just, I mean, even business-wise, I think that helps you see how other cultures um, work within business, what their norms are, how they think about it, um, things like that. So I think there's there's a lot of different advantages. Um, also, Zach touched on just the mentality you have in day-to-day -day life, I think, really influences the way you work, the way you think, all those kind of things. So um, everyone we've come in contact with has been super receptive um, in that regard. And 
and always willing to have a conversation. So it's, it's been a really um, fun experience so far. Okay, great, great. Um, so, so Zach, I'm, I'm going to give this some version of this question to, to everyone. But Zach, for you, you know, where you are now, uh, who would be the ideal client for, for you to, to bring in to the firm? The, the most ideal client is, is, you know, someone that was like me as an NFL player that I, you know, there were so many things I didn't know and came into money at 21. I was a second round draft pick and, you know, and you know, another ideal client is retired players because the, the way the financial system set up for, for currently for NFL players is you just have a bunch of brokers going in there that don't do any comprehensive planning for the most part and just do investment management. And so, I mean, I know how much, how important it is to look at the entire financial life of a player and then get them on the right track early. And then for retired guys, you know, the spike in income as you make so much when you're playing, it sets up guys for failure once they're done playing because of that adjustment. If, if, if their spend is just too high, the math doesn't, it just doesn't Mm -hmm. work. So I mean, I, I know how much I would have benefited from comprehensive planning to where that's why I wanted to get the CFP and why I wanted to go after that. And, and, and you know, I had an options at brokerage houses and I, you know, immediately crossed them off the list because um, it's like the fiduciary standard. I wish I would have known that what, what that was when I was younger. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a legit thing because if you, you incentivize someone to hit goals at a brokerage house they're going to hit the goals it's like having a guy have 10 sacks as his bonus he's going to go get 10 sacks probably so um it's, it's as simple as that but you, you got to align your advisor's interests and you know i like that you you hit real quickly on how to evaluate an advisor and at least ask a, some good questions because how how they get compensated if you're not aligning their interests with yours as a player um i've seen it with even you know guys i retired with they just they don't have the financial knowledge all the time and it's um it, they could be so much better off and there should be you know there should be more uh, more alignment of incentives with with your advisor and who they are and what their expertise is and if, whether they actually understand an athlete and the niche and and what how different you are especially nfl guys i mean you're essentially sacrificing your body for a set amount of years it's not going to last very long the average career is so short so all those all those factors come into why you know why the numbers can be bad but it's 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 not a, a unsolvable problem and uh, i'm, I'm going to be part of a solution at, at, at hopefully here soon i'm sure you will and, and, and kudos to you for starting off right by by um you know, tackling the CFP exam, you know, right out the gate. So a lot of people wait in uh, years and, and kind of focus on making money before they get the credentials. So you know, kudos to you for, um, for, for starting off your career right in the industry. Um, so Darian, for, for you, you know, you're in the uh, coaching position and I imagine, you know, recruiting is, is part of your responsibility as, a, as an assistant coach. And you know, obviously, recruiting is going to be unique and different in a, a COVID environment. Uh, but you know, talk a bit about who would be the ideal athlete that, that you would want to recruit to to Southern Miss. What would you be looking for? Uh, so I just want to say yes, uh, Keith. It is very uh, different this year uh, with COVID. Uh, we're trying to do a lot of uh, virtual. Uh, recruiting, I guess you could say. So actually tomorrow we have like a, a showcase and, you know, a couple uh, local clubs are live streaming some of the girls. So uh, definitely trying to get as much film and I've been kind of glued to my computer and just trying to, you know, we're sending a bunch of emails and making a bunch of phone calls. Um, so it definitely is, it's different because whenever you are in person recruiting and you're at tournaments, you're able to see a lot of the intangible things that we're looking for. So, I mean, first and foremost, uh, we're always looking for uh, skill and, you know, we're trying to get girls that touch a certain height at 10 feet and, you know, that can pass, that can serve kind of an all around player. But the next thing you kind of look at is the intangibles. And that's really uh, important when you're doing in person, because you can see how 
uh, young student athletes are interacting with their teammates and their coaches and even their parents um, as well. I funny, it's not really a funny story, but you know, we've seen kids kind of uh, yell at their parents for not having a water bottle. And it's kind of like, well, I definitely don't need that kind of negative energy um, on our team. And so I honestly, doesn't matter how good you are, I'm not going to recruit you and I'm just going to pass and move on to the next person. And so uh, those are some of the things that we look for in person. But um, now that we've kind of transitioned into the virtual and a lot of phone calls, um, some of the things that we're always preaching to the kids that we're recruiting is just someone who's coachable, um, someone who's going to buy in, not into the training and into the program and what we're trying to build here. Um, we actually, at Southern Miss, we just had a brand new uh, volleyball only facility, which is very rare in, in collegiate volleyball for women's. Usually they share it with uh, another indoor team, maybe women's basketball and gymnastics, but um, we're pretty lucky here and we're a mid-major as well, but we have our own volleyball facility with three volleyball courts. And so definitely we've been preaching to kids um, we need someone who's just going to be kind of a gym rat almost like you have this awesome facility that can, you can come in here, turn the lights on, blast some music and just kind of do your own thing. And so um, not a lot of teams have that opportunity. And so if you don't take advantage of that, you know, you don't always need a coach in the gym. And so you can just come in here and do your thing. Um, we definitely are looking for a kid like that. And um, like I said, willingness to buy in not only into our training, but into the program and kind of where do you want to leave your legacy and your mark as far as, you know, do you want to help this team be kind of a supporting cast and, but we can, you know, win a conference title make it to the NCAA tournament, or are you just trying to be in the record books and I'm just going to get all the kills and that's kind of it. And so definitely someone who's, you know, there are kids out there that just see the gear and the photos and, you know, we're Adidas school and we, I'm not gonna lie, we have some nice Adidas gear, but there's definitely more to that um, just in the gear and the photos. So, you know, someone who's willing to put in a lot of work in order to be successful. And then as well as, you know, you're a student first, you're a student athlete. And so definitely a kid who's, you know, we have amazing programs here and who's going to take school seriously. And you know, Excel and, you know, you're getting your degree, we're paying you to get your degree, college degree. And so we definitely look for kids that um, have a strong work ethic, not obviously not all on the court, but as well as um, in the classroom. And lastly, someone who's just kind of involved in the community a little bit, who's willing to give back and kind of uh, just be an overall good person. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just kind of get sucked into this, like, oh, the, I'm just here to play my sport. But you know, you represent a brand of Southern Miss. And so it'd be, you know, we need you to make sure that you're a good person, you know, especially on social media age these days, um, a lot of things we can, we can find you easily. And so definitely just be an overall good person and be involved in the community and be willing to give back and represent uh, our brand very well. Uh, great, those are all great points. Uh, so, so Julie, uh, similar question for you. So who would be the ideal athlete to join the, the Weevolve platform? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely some of the pieces Darian just touched on. Um, a couple of the words that come to mind um, for us are open-minded and curious um, individuals and athletes. Um, those just willing to engage within our own community um, and outside and just get a little bit vulnerable um, and helping us step forward as a collective. Um, so, you know, we don't really care where you're currently at as long as you have the mindset um, that you want to get better, you want to learn, you want to take advantage of the resources that we're providing um, and just sort of take over your, your, uh, your path and your future. Um, and then, you know, just having the drive to, to help the next generation. Um, you know, a lot of people go through the experience and they have their own struggles, um, but then there's this gap where those same people aren't really giving back to the the younger generation. And so if we can create more of a cycle like that, where, you know, you're helping someone maybe understand certain situations a few years before you would have um, without that mentorship, then, you know, we're creating progress for each generation moving forward. Okay. Yeah. So we're a little over uh, uh, 650. So we have about 10 minutes or so. And I was going to open up the 
the Q and A for everyone else who's on the call. And I know we have one question right now. And, and Jose, you can take that question, and we can open it up to anyone else that's on the call that has other questions, other questions for the panelists or for uh, me or Jose. Jose, you want to take this question? Yeah, sure. And and Keith, feel free to uh, add on to my answer afterwards. Um, so Draven, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, um, but Draven was asking in investing, what do you think about targeting dividend yields? Um, and secondly, uh, targeting fresh IPOs in a thriving market. Um, so regarding your first question, um, personally, I do like uh, companies with strong dividend yields, uh, particularly because they tend to be safer and more reliable companies. The problem with just targeting dividend yields, um, you will lack some diversification. Um, typically, the the companies that have strong dividend yields are the ones within you know utility sectors, um, uh, specific sectors that have you know um, very stable companies um, that are able to provide those dividends. Um, but if you were to target dividend uh, companies that provide dividend yields, I would look for companies that are very consistent. So if you find a company that is consistently providing a high dividend yield, and it has been doing that for the past 25 years, then chances are they're going to be a reliable company and they have a very strong business model. Um, regarding your second question about the IPOs in a thriving market, well, today's market is really interesting, um, considering especially with the, the, the pandemic um, and the government's response to that, there's been a lot of money being flooded into the markets. So uh, there are a lot of investors out there that are looking for anything to throw their money in. Um, so I would expect you know, future IPOs, especially if they have really strong business models and have proven to be profitable over time, um, they can be really strong investment, uh, investments for you to make. Um, but be very careful with with IPOs because they can be extremely volatile. Um, and by volatile, I just mean you know they're constantly going up and down in price. And you know if you can't handle that amount of risk, and um, if you're not willing to lose your money to an IPO, then go ahead and 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 invest in it. But you know one of the things that I always preach to people when you're investing and creating a portfolio is make sure you diversify. Um, Make sure you're you're looking at different uh, industries and and different types of companies and making sure that you have uh, a significant amount of you know companies within your portfolio to make sure that you're not just putting all your eggs in in one basket. Keith, you want to add to that? No, th I thought you did a great job. Good, good job with the question. I'll, I'll add one point. So I think it's interesting that you ask a question that you, that the person framed the question dividend yields and IPOs, which are really at like two extremes, right? So, but that's good though, because it might be a, you know, an investment approach is, you know, we you call it a barbell approach where you can have, you know, at one end of the spectrum, you can be very conservative at the other end, you can be, you know, very aggressive and somewhere in between is, is kind of where your overall portfolio is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, great question and, and, and great answer, Jose. Um, so I could come up with some other questions for everyone, but I, I think it'd be interesting to, uh, open it up to other folks that are on the line, but then also to the panelists. You know, if the panelists have any questions for for each other. Healthy financial future. Okay. Panelists, or do we want to take? So let me get to this question right here. So, what is the best thing I could do right now uh, to work towards a healthy financial future? Um, I'd say the, the number one thing you can do is, is quantify your goals. So, you know, I'm biased, you know, Jose and Zach are probably biased as well, where we would say you might want to seek out professional advice and work with a, you know, certified financial planner, but, um, going through the financial planning process, you don't have to necessarily be a certified financial planner to go through the financial planning process. So the process of where am I, where am I right now? Where do I want to go? And what are the best vehicles and avenues that are going to help to bring me and get me to that position? Like that's the financial planning process, like in a nutshell. So first and foremost, 
write down what your goals are and then chart out the path that's going to help you achieve those goals. So my advice would be the best thing you can do right now is write down your goals and, and then quantify them those goals that'd be advice if you um panelists panelists you have any questions for for one another no okay um and draven draven you have another question so you want to type your question oh, all right there it is we got technical analysis question uh oh <laughs> did i just see forex <laughs> I see Forex and MACD and SRI. I'm, I'm out well, on the technical analysis. <laughs> that sounds like a problem set question. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to do your problem set for you. <laughs> <Try>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but already, yeah, so I'll, he, I'll give you a short one. It's already priced in. <laughs> right, right. It's efficient market. It's already priced in. Um, so he asked a question about foreign exchange markets and you know, MACD, SRI, like pretty technical questions. So um, maybe we'll take that one offline. You, you have a, a, another question for us? What's up, B? <laughs> Darian, I got a question for you. Do, do, does your university have um, a personal finance class that this, uh, students can sign up for? Uh, I don't believe so, but um, oh. it's interesting that you say that because actually um, when I was at Kentucky, they actually did bring somebody in and we had, I think maybe two sessions and they gave us a book and um, it was actually required for all student athletes to go. And I don't know if, um, any of you guys are familiar, but a lot of colleges now they're doing cost of attendance uh, checks. So it's like an extra, I don't want to get into all the details, but it's basically extra money that can pay for, you know, flights home and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when that was starting to become a little bit more popular, they brought in some a financial uh, planning person just to kind of talk about like, hey, these are some of the things that you could do with X this money that you're getting, you know, extra $600. So um, I definitely, it would be nice for, you know, somebody to come in and kind of teach the kids and cause you know, can spend yeah, money I, on so a I've, little I've, fun thing. <laughs> I've, I've been saying this one for a long time. It's, I was like required to take plant biology, what, you know, 10 years ago and rem <laughs> remember nothing but mitochondria. Um, and so like, I would have been way better off my last year taking like a personal finance and, just did basic, you know, here's what your tax, you know, here's how you file taxes. Here's, you know, here's debt. Here's, here's how, what, you know, what a financial plan is. Here's like, here's what investments 101. What is, you know, just simple stuff, stock market, bond market. I mean, you won't pick up everything, but I think in your final year of school, you'd get way more out of that than you would, um, you know, a lot of the classes you forget. That's for sure. Uh, absolutely. I agree. I mean, I'm still calling my parents to figure out how to do all this stuff too. <laughs> yeah. Julie, did you have a personal finance class when you were in school? No? You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, no, I don't ever remember talking about that or having, or maybe if we did, it was real quick, like overview, but yeah. I don't think anything particular. There, there are certain states, I me. Mean, I'm I'm of the mind. I'm in the camp that personal finance should be taught um, early. So you know, you should probably take a personal finance class before you graduate high school. Um, but it, it still astounds me that it's not pervasive where everyone thinks that you need to, you know, have a good understanding of money, how the economy works, how money works. You know, prior to at least prior to graduating college, right? I mean, we didn't. I was a finance major, but we didn't take we didn't have personal finance classes in in, in school and undergrad. Um, either. So I, I think it's something that should be, that should be taught. And um, yeah, I think it's something that should be taught, um, you know, early and often. So we're a couple minutes over, over seven o'clock. I'm going to open it up for uh, a couple more questions. If anybody has any, any questions, any comments? 
I'll, uh, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, I guess Keith or, or Jose, this would probably best fit you guys. What, what would be kind of the, the number one mistake you, you see a lot of athletes make early on, um, either out of school or out of their career um, that is, I guess, detrimental to their financial health? Yeah, I mean, kind of back to that, that point that I made a couple of minutes ago is, is just not having a plan and, you know, not realizing that once the, the check goes away, if you, if you hadn't planned for it, um, that you're going to put yourself in a very difficult position and, and really set yourself up for failure. So I would say that's probably the, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest and most common mistake is, is, is people just not recognizing how important it is to, to, to plan. And psychologically, um, you know, it, it is a big step. It is a big transition. And you, know, you, you want to put as much of your finances on, on autopilot and have as much of it, you know, automated and kind of set up for you. Um, you know, prior to, you know, prior to, to, to leaving professional sports. Do you have anything else? Any, any closing thoughts? Hey, okay. Is, the, is the, C, the CFA worth it? Three years, three tests? For me, it was. I mean, yeah, for me, for me, it was. I think, um, yeah, for me it was. I, I, I was an overachiever. I always looked at it as this might sound silly, but I always looked at it as like if I'm going to manage someone's money, I'm going to have the designation that people who manage money have. <laughs> like, to me, it was always that simple, right? So you like you 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 mature in the industry, you grow in the industry, you realize that um, you, know, you don't necessarily need to have designations for people to you know trust you with your money, with their money, and to you know give you money to manage, but. Um, for me to feel comfortable, you know, doing it for me to feel as though, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm professional and I'm qualified to do this. It was, it was important for me. It's tough though. I mean, it's, 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 you know, definitely, you know, three bears of, of, of an exam, but, uh, it's worth it on the, on the other side. Uh, Darian, Julian, Ju Julie, any last thoughts, questions? What time okay. is it, Julie? You keep coming up. So thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you, Julie, for, for staying up with us. You, you want to let everyone know what time it is? Your time? I'm blaming the, the mute issue that it's one o'clock in the morning. There so, you go. Exactly. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're getting past my limit, but it's all right. Right. Okay. Uh, I was curious for Zach what you do for the week after you win the Super Bowl. Oh, they throw you a parade. So that was it was the coldest day ever in Seattle, but the parade was one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. They said there was a million people. It was like, we flew back while well, we partied that night at the Super Bowl, of course, but we flew back the next day. And then the parade was like on Tuesday and they had us in like these, like, uh, these like army trucks driving through downtown Seattle. And like, they, like the whole schools were let out. Like people took off work to just attend the parade. And so, yeah, when in the first, first ever Super Bowl in Seattle, man, it's, it's one of the yeah. most special moments you can ever have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. S Sam, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I can, I can wrap us up. Um, well, thank you again to, uh, to everyone that, that, that tuned in. Uh, I know I learned a lot, even, even just sitting here listening as well. Um, I, I hope uh, everyone else got some takeaways as well. And, and, and thank you to, uh, to Keith, Jose, Zach, Darian, and, and Julie for coming on. Julie, thanks for, for staying late with us. <laughs> I hope you can get some sleep. Um, but really appreciate the time. I uh, really appreciate all, all your knowledge and all your really unique and interesting insights and uh, hope to keep in touch with you guys. Yeah, definitely, Sam. Thank you for putting everything together. We appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Everyone, this was fun. Talk to you all.